Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness! No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Would you join me in prayer? Good Father in heaven, we thank you for being able to open up your word and allow it to, by the power of your spirit, speak into our lives. We pray, Father God, that you take these ancient words um, from the best sermon that's ever been preached by the best teacher that's ever preached a message. And we pray, Father God, that you help us to see that as relevant as it was back then to, to Jesus' first century audience, it's, it's relevant to us today. As we sit here and listen in this sanctuary, Father God, as we connect online, Father, that his words mean as much to us now as they, they, they did then. And I pray, Father God, that your Holy Spirit would carry it to the deep recesses of our hearts that need to hear these words. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said, amen. You know, there's, a, there's an old story about a, a rich man who was very unhappy with his life. He couldn't understand why he was unhappy, so he went around and he spoke to to different religious leaders, and he came to a rabbi, an old, an old Jewish rabbi, and the rich man was, was really kind of this Ebenezer Scrooge type individual, right? He, he, was, he was wealthy, but he had little concern for, for other people and for other people's needs. And so he kind of told the, the rabbi his, his plight. You know, he, he began to explain to it, but he really didn't explain, he couldn't explain what was the root of his unhappiness. And so the, the rabbi invited the rich man. He says, come on over here for, for a moment. He said, I want, you to, I want you to look out this window and tell me what you see. And so he did. So, so the rich man, he looked out the window and he just saw people walking on the streets, going about their business. And the rich man said, I, I see nothing extraordinary. <laughs> I see men, women, and children just doing what they do every day. And then the rabbi said, okay. Come, come over here next. Come over here and, and look, look into this, this mirror that was hanging on his wall. And so the rich man, he did. He, he stood there and he peered into the mirror. And the rabbi asked him, so tell me, what, what do you see now? And the rich man, unamused, he said, well, of course, I see myself. And so the, the rabbi, in a very soft, soft but stern voice, he said, both, both the window and the glass, the window and the mirror are made out of the same material of, of glass, but you cover one in silver and you can no longer see others, but only yourself. This week, we return to our study of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6. If you have your Bibles, your Bible apps, join me there in Matthew chapter 6. And we have in front of us, we have Rabbi Yeshua. We have Jesus, the teacher, and he's inviting all of us, each one of us here and out there, he's inviting us to take a long, hard look in the mirror. And, and he challenges us to live radically different and distinct from the world and the culture that we are steeped in. And we're going to see in, in the text that at the heart of our study, Jesus is reminding us to be watchful in our relationship with money and possessions. Because he knows that, that even those people who were seeking him, who, who even desired to follow him, who were even a part of the 12, he knows then and he also knows now that, 
even followers of Christ who have the best intentions, that we can become self-focused when just a little silver is added to our lives. And so picking up with verse 19, here's what Jesus says. He says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. I I want you to notice from the very beginning as Jesus begins to launch out into this teaching upon money and possessions, Jesus recognizes something that's instinctive inside of each of us. He recognizes that each and every person has this investment instinct, that they're born with this desire to to save and to to store up. And that's true for a lot of people here, whether it's a tip jar in the freezer or at stock in Amazon.com. This this passage here reminds us that, that each of us, that people just naturally have this innate instinct to value something. And so I want to say from the very beginning, this desire to store up, this desire to save, this desire to value something, it isn't bad. But from Jesus' point of view, what we value is, is largely revealed by which pane of glass we choose to gaze into and to look through. Jesus is, is, is teaching his, his disciples and the onlookers these things, and he wants them to begin to wrestle through some questions that, that we need to begin to wrestle through. He wants us to wrestle the questions like, what are you saving for? What are you storing up for? You know, where are you depositing your time and your talents and your treasures? Is it for you, for yourself, or, or is it for others? And, and Jesus, he pulls no punches. He lets us know right off the bat that storing up for ourselves, if that's our goal, if that's the target, he's saying, hey, that's, that's a bad investment. Because sooner or later, if you're storing up for yourselves and it's bound to this earth, you're going to find, you're going to find that moths and vermin are going to get to it. You're going to find that rust is going to get to it and set in and begin to, to make it deteriorate. And what Jesus is, is speaking about here, really, we see in, in the law of nature. Jesus is basically talking about the law of entropy. He's talking about how everything is going from, from, from order to disorder, that everything that we see, everything that we touch, everything that we experience is, is eventually going to break down because everything is moving to a place of eventual breakdown in all of creation, from order to disorder. And I'll say this, you experience, you experience this, this idea of entropy in your everyday lives. I mean, you could clean up a room, and then entropy, disguised as your children, will come into that room. <laughs> and it'll become cluttered within, within minutes, right? We, we have a, 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 grand, a grandson and a granddaughter, and our grandson Judah, he knows how to walk. <laughs> and so that means he, he can motor, he can get around. And, and this is a new experience for me all over again because we had moved past the stage of having to put things up high. <laughs> but now I'm learning all over again, you got to put things up high <laughs> if you don't want them to mess with. Judah is a little example of the law of entropy. He goes and he just unpacks everything. He's not really interested in playing with it necessarily. He's just simply interested in unpacking it. You follow me? You experience the law of entropy by, by looking in the mirror. Some of you young folks here, girls here, right? You look in the mirror and you see smooth skin and wonderful hair and all, all that stuff. But years will pass and <laughs> she's, she's fixing her hair. Good, nice job. I like that. That was nice, right? But years will pass and, and entropy will set in, right? And you'll begin to see wrinkles in your face. <laughs> and you begin to see your hair turn different colors. Now, what's cool about my hair is... Students, kids are now doing their hair, dyeing their hair my color, gray, which is kind of cool. My son did that, right? (laughs) Jared. So you see entropy setting in, and then then you just kind of see it in all the things that we see around us. Buildings begin to decay. Cars begin to rust out. Clothes begin to break down. I, I have right here, right here, I brought with me a bowl of entropy. Right here, I have different iterations of the iPhone. From the very beginning, <laughs> right? And, and none of them work. None of them, none of them work. 
It, years and years and years, they, they either, the screens cracked, they broke down, right? They got updated. And so Mac has this wonderful strategic plan for all of its customers. It's called plan obsolescence. They plan things going out so that you have to buy the next and the newest and the, the biggest. But, but that's the idea. Usually we, we kind of move along and we think, I've got to get something bigger. I've got to get something faster. I've got to get something better. But then over time, entropy sets in and it all just goes to not. That's why I got an Android. And now that works well. And I'm not worried at all about that breaking down. You, you know, these, these iPhones and these iPods and these iPads and all technology, it, it's a great reminder of what Jesus is telling us about the stark reality that, that all things that are bound to this earth, all things that are bound to this earth will end up decaying and breaking down with this earth. So Jesus wants us to be mindful. Mindful about what we invest in. And listen, he doesn't remove this innate desire, this instinct to invest and value things. Instead, what Jesus does is he desires to redirect it for us. And so listen to what he says in verse 20 and 21. He says, But store for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart is also. Read that with me, that bottom line. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. He invites us to take this instinct of valuing something and then begin to redirect our gaze away from ourselves and onto the treasures that God values. To be store, stored up in a place that's impervious to decay and destruction and, and even death. And, and what's interesting in that last line, this is where Jesus really makes it personal because he, he says, he's linking, he's associating, he's saying that our decision... To, to decide what we value, where we choose to invest, he's saying it's, it's a matter of our, of our heart. That it reveals something about the heart issues that we have. And when Jesus is talking about the heart, he's not talking about this organ that's pumping blood. He's illustrating how the heart is, when we do this, it's a universal symbol of our emotion and our affection and our devotion and our commitment. It, it represents what we care about, who we care about, what's important to us. And he tells, us, he tells us that our hearts and our possessions, our wealth, our stuff, he's telling us that there, there's a connection there that maybe we don't like to admit, but, but it exists. That sometimes our heart, our emotions, our affections, our devotion is, is so connected to our stuff, it's like it's symbiotic. It feeds off of one another. I mean, here's, here's, a, here's a great example of this. You want to see how hearts are attached to things. At the beginning of the camp, Jeremiah, what if you would have said, everybody bring your phones up here, set them on the front of the stage, you're not getting them back to the end of the week. How would that have went over, Jeremiah? Uh, I mean, it could have been a riot. <laughs> <laughs> right, there could have been a riot. Would that have been true? And, and so it reveals something. It tells us something. And, and that probably, would, I guarantee, that wouldn't have been just the students. It would have been adults too, right? Parents and sponsors. Be because the reality is, even though they're things, they're inanimate objects, they have a way of, of, of attaching our heart to them in a way that our emotions, our affections, our devotions begin to defend them. And Jesus is saying, Jesus is saying that, that we have to be mindful and careful about this. Because whatever you treasure, your, your heart ends up there. And, and vice versa, it works the other way around. That if we have something that we really have affection for and a love for, we, we tend to take the treasure, whatever we're earning or making, and we tend to invest our money there over and over and over and over and over, getting the biggest and the baddest and the latest until it goes out and we need the next biggest and the baddest and the latest. Now, that's one thing to talk about phones, but what about when, what about when pursuing our career or our future or whatever, what, what about when it's pursuing financial gain at the expense of a healthy family? What happens when a mom or a dad or anybody else says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to store up this nest egg for the future so that someday I'll be able to spend quality time with my family while all along for decades missing quality time with their family, sacrificing the very thing that they believe they're storing up for, which they have no guarantee will even be there. In the end, 
Jesus is saying be very careful and mindful about where our treasure is because our hearts are attached to those things. He's not telling us we can't treasure things. He's just saying we need to begin to treasure the right things. And Jesus doesn't hold back at all in this passage. He underscores the importance of keeping our eyes focused on the right kind of treasure and in the right direction. In verses 22 and 23, this is what he says. He says, the eye is the lamp of the body. And if your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Jesus is started out his teaching with these polar opposites, right? This earthly treasure versus this heavenly treasure. And now again, here he gives us another polarity. He talks about these healthy eyes versus these unhealthy eyes. And this whole eye in the lamp, it's a little bit harder of an analogy to break down, but let me give it a try. I want you to think of it this way. I wear glasses. How many, how many of you wear glasses in here? Anybody else? Glasses are contact lenses, okay? Many of you. I've worn glasses and contact lenses since I was in sixth grade, Right? My vision is 20 over 400. Really, if you look at this, that's pretty much how I see things without my glasses. I'm legally blind. And so it's very difficult. But I have to wear my glasses all the time. And um, that means when I'm working outside and it's humid or hot or I'm doing sports, they, they can get smudged, they can get dirty, they can get rained on. And if you, if you wear glasses, you know that can be pretty irritating when your glasses get messed up, right? I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty irritating because... You can't see clearly, and they cease to function for the very use. They cease to function as glasses to allow you to be able to see clearly. Jesus, in the same way, is saying to us that when our our vision is clouded, and when our vision is clouded by this continual focus on dark things, right? Continual focus on money and possessions, he's telling us that it has the ability to blur and even to blind us to the to the extraordinary things that God values and the extraordinary things that God treasures. And, and by the way, the, the things that God values and God treasures are, are the people that I'm looking at, the people that you see when you look out of a window, because those are the only, if I can say things, those are the only things that will transfer from earth to heaven someday. That's it. Nothing else on this earth, not this building, not your vehicle, not your 401k, nothing else will transfer from earth to heaven except the person that you see standing across from you. We're the ones built for eternity. People are built for eternity. And the Lord wants us to see, he's, he's warning us not to be blinded by possessions and by greed. And, and what's crazy is this is so applicable and apropos from from kids like Isaiah's age all, all the way to senior saints, right? All the way to me and, and folks that are just a little older than me. I mean, it's applicable all the way across the board. Jesus wants to warn us against being greedy because it can, that greed can lead us down a dark path. There's, there's an old book. It's called The Day America Told the Truth. And it's, it's a book where a guy named James Patterson, he interviews people, and, and he just kind of asks them, you know, kind of anonymously, like, hey, just kind of tell the truth about this. I'm not going to print your name. Nobody's going to know who you are, this, that, or the other. So you have an opportunity. And so he just interviews thousands and thousands of people, and he asks them a bunch of different questions. And one of the questions he asks them is, what would you do for $10 million? This is, a, this is a, actually a picture of $10 million, right? There's, the stat continues to go down. And so that's his question. What would you do for $10 million? Maybe you could begin to think about in your head what you'd be willing to do for $10 million. But I tell you, as, as he asked that question, it opened up, it opened up the darkness of setting your eyes on money and possessions and valuing it above all other things. It opened up how dark inside people can get. 25% of the people interviewed for $10 million said they would abandon their families. 23% said they would prostitute themselves for a week or more. 16% said they would give up their American citizenship. Another 16% said they would leave their spouses. 10% said they would withhold testimony and let a murderer go free. 7% for $10 million said they would kill a stranger. And 3% for $10 million said they would put their own children up for adoption. When a person's vision is so darkened 
by possessions and greed. They're willing to sacrifice their lives, their families, their marriages, their reputation, their morality, and their eternity for something that is temporary, something that is earthly and bound to perish on this earth. And Jesus says it aptly. He says, how great is that darkness. Jesus instead says, I want you to set your gaze on something greater and grander, more beautiful. I want the light to flow in you and to illuminate goodness. And that begins, that begins by turning our eyes to him. As an example, <laughs> Jesus says, you know, um, foxes have, have a place to, to go and sleep at night, but the Son of Man has no place to, <laughs> to place his head, to lie his head. Jesus wasn't a wealthy person, but Jesus was filled. So we follow him and we follow Jesus' fulfillment. It's like the words of that old hymn. You guys remember that song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus? I, I, I tell you what, as a, as a young believer growing up in the faith, that was one of those choruses over and over that just rang true. And I found it to be true in every circumstance, especially in a circumstance where maybe you're feeling like, hey, I need to do this or I want this. We're just reminded to turn our eyes back on Christ. Would you sing that with me? Could we do that? Through the mask, we could do that. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim. In the light of his glory and grace. And all God's people said, Amen. Jesus, Jesus wants us to set his, our eyes on, on him, and then he brings, us, he brings us back to what's really at stake here, the core issue. It's a heart issue. Yes, it's an eye issue, but ultimately... He tells us in this scripture, in this teaching, that it's a lordship issue. Verse 24, he says, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other. You'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. That word serve is, is, is as strong as you can imagine it. Really, you, you can actually say be enslaved. You can't be enslaved to one or a slave to one or the other. There's, there's no way to water down that word. A, a servant a servant is one that is held in bondage to either the Lord or to money. Now, Jesus expressly states here this, this, other, this third polarity, God versus money. And, and really in the original language, if you were to go back maybe through in some of your King James versions, you could see that it actually says God or what? Mammon, right? God or mammon. And so money often equals mammon and in and, and, if you're familiar with the scriptures, if you've done a few studies, you know that, that mammon has always had this, this negative connotation and for good reason. In many of the translations, they actually even capitalize mammon. And they did that because they wanted you to understand that, that people have personified money or mammon in such a way that it has become like a personal idol to them, that their hearts are devoted to it like a personal idol. And so mammon and money, but listen, Though mammon has a negative connotation to us now and has for, for many centuries, um, it didn't begin that way. The, the idea of mammon in Hebrew culture was, was really just a common way that, that the Hebrews would describe um, the property or the fortune that they were saving up, that they had entrusted maybe to someone else or someplace else for safekeeping until the time that they actually needed it. It was like, it was like having a savings account or a 401k when you were going to retire and you needed it. It was there and ready for you. So the concept of, of mammon really was largely neutral and even, even responsible and positive for the people at Jesus' time. They would have seen this as like, hey, mammon's actually a good thing, isn't it, Lord? But, but over time, it actually began to change. The idea wasn't something, something of this positive idea to that which you kind of entrusted and then we're going to use later, but it became this thing that actually one began to place their trust in as far as for their future. Not just, not just something that's entrusted, but it became something that people said, no, I trust it more than anything else for my future. Which is, which is a space that only the Lord God should occupy. 
in our lives. Amen? Jesus is speaking here when he's talking about God and money. He's he's speaking against placing our hope and our security in a fortune that we've stored up for ourselves because he's telling us, and he said this all through the passage, it's ultimately going to fail you in your future. It's ultimately going to draw your heart's affection and attention away from where it should be. But, But more than warning us about the dangers of misplaced trust, Jesus wants us to understand the core issue, and that is that as a sovereign God will not share the throne of our hearts with anyone or anything else that he demands and desires complete, total lordship. I want to be clear here because I see Jeremy Cowan, who is an investment manager here, <laughs> chairman of our elders. I want to be clear. Jesus, Jesus isn't advocating that we can't earn a living, that we can't buy things, that we should be responsible and save, right? Obviously, it clearly had a positive connotation at one time, and I think he wants us to get back to that positive connotation. I think his desire of sharing this with us is for us to understand that sometimes it could cross a threshold if we're not mindful and watchful. It can cross a threshold where acquiring things becomes our central focus. And before we know it, all the possessions that we own, we find that we can't do without them. And they, all of a sudden, they begin to own us more than anything else. And Jesus is saying, be careful. You get to a certain place and, you know, you think in Jesus' first century audience and even in this audience, people would say, hey, this is not a big deal because they just don't have much, right? I don't, I, don't, I don't have a whole lot to be connected to or be devoted to, so I don't, I don't have to worry because Jesus isn't speaking to me. And, and the truth of the matter is you don't have to have a baseball or football player or basketball player salary, a mega salary, in, in order to really kind of, really kind of you know, deal in a negative way with possessions and wealth and material gain and all those things, or be enslaved to the desire. Um, Jesus, Jesus wants us to know no, nobody gets off of the, the hook. Sometimes you can be enslaved to what you don't have, thinking about, oh, I wish I had this, I wish I had this, I wish I had this. Um, it can be even for material possessions that are a mirage and, and not ag- actually existing in your life, you can still be enslaved to those, and Jesus wants us to be careful of those as well. Jesus is an anti-material goods. He really is anti-grab-all-you-can-while-you-can because he wants us to know we can't serve both at once. We think we can, but, but we can't serve both at once. It's, it's kind of like driving somewhere where I've never been. Right? Maybe I'm going somewhere in the city, and on my dash, I've got... I've got Google Maps, and he's telling me I'm going to take a left here, take a right here, take a left here, take a right here. But I've got Google Maps on my dash, and then I've got Carrie right to my right riding shotgun. And she's been to the place that we've been before, right? She's been, and she knows the direction. By the way, Carrie has a much better sense of direction than I do. She knows how to get her. I'm not, I'm not ashamed to admit that. She, she always has had a better sense of direction. But I've got Google Maps, and I've got Carrie, and they're both giving me directions, At some point, I have to choose <laughs> who I'm going to listen to. And husbands, you and I both know that either choice has its consequences, doesn't it? <laughs> right? But we all have a choice to make. I wonder, I wonder if you were to take a long, hard look in the mirror and you were to begin to think about the things, you, the things you hold dear, what would you see? If you were to look in the mirror and think about what you value, would your value revolve primarily around you and what fulfills you? And, and would you be willing to step aside and to step away from just gazing upon your own reflection and your own, folk, and your own needs and begin to see what God sees, to begin to look through that, that mirror and to look at the extraordinary people that God has created in his image that he deems as his treasure above all, above all else and say, this is where I need to invest because this is a treasure that will translate to heaven. 
you are, you are his treasure, whether you, you know it or not. In, in Deuteronomy chapter 32, we get a picture of this treasure. Uh, Moses is speaking. He's talking to the children of, of Israel, and he speaks to them, and he says, he says to them that they are the apple of God's eye. And it's one of my favorite illustrations and analogies, the apples of God's eye, because for the longest time, I didn't understand what it meant. And then when you just do a little research, you discover that the apple of God's eye is that little reflection that you can see when you get close enough to somebody, I mean close, and you can see yourself reflected in their, in their eye. It, it's, it's a picture of somebody desiring to be close and intimate. It's a picture of somebody that has their eye on you because you are what's most important to them. You are the apple of God's eye. You are what he treasures most in this world. And God desires for us to treasure what he treasures and to invest our time, our talents, everything we have in order to see them transferred and translated into eternity. We, we have this morning, I, I wanted to carve out some time, we have this morning an opportunity to invest some time and some prayer for a young man who has been created in God's image. Many of you received an email this past week of a young brother named Nick Biggs. He's one of the sons of, of, of Jenny and, and Mike Biggs. You know that Jenny heads up um, Feed My Starving Children. Mike has been a servant leader at Gateway in many capacities. He served on the elder board as well for our church family. Nick is, is 23 years young, and he's been diagnosed with... Um, lymphoma this past week. Um, it's a rare non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and right now they are, they're waiting for pathology. They're waiting for scans to come back in order for us to know the stage. And so the, the bigs have, have asked us as a church family to join them in, in praying for, for Nick's complete healing. Amen. And this is, this is Nick. This Tall, cool drink of water right here. This is, this is Nick. He, he's, he's an incredible young man. Um, a dear friend to, to one of my sons, Jaron, who they grew up together. Um, they would like for us to pray for Nick's complete healing. They'd like for us to, to pray that it's not an advanced stage and that it hadn't spread beyond um, the lymph nodes of the places identified in his chest. And they, they'd like for us to pray as a church family that there would be a clear path for, for treatment and that it would be effective. And they'd also like us to pray for them as a family, that, that they would find strength and that each of them would find peace and comfort in the Lord during this very difficult season. And so church, can we do that? I know we can't gather up on the stage like we, we, we normally do, but we can stand to our feet this morning. Can we do that? As I've been thinking about the situation in Nick, I, I've, I've been getting this picture in my mind where Jesus was teaching. He was in a house, and there was a friend, a family member who couldn't get to Jesus on his own. He couldn't get to Jesus on his own. And so some friends actually put that friend who was sick on a mat, put him on a mat, and they couldn't get into the house that Jesus was teaching, so they crawled up on top of the roof. They peeled back the roof, and they began to lower down this friend that desperately needed the touch of Christ. They began to lower him down so that he could, he could be healed by Jesus. And, and I want you to understand that what we're doing right now is what they did back then. We're taking our corner of the mat... And we're lifting up Nick, this young man, and we're lowering him down into the presence of Jesus and say, Jesus, you do, please, you do only what you can do. Amen? And so if you, if, if you can even, maybe you can even reach out and just like you're holding on to that mat as we pray. And you can stand, you can kneel, whatever you want to do, but if, if you could, just hold on to that mat and let's lower our brother Nick into the presence of Jesus to be healed. Will you pray with me? Good Father in heaven, we, we come now in the name of Jesus on behalf of Nick. 
We know you love him. We know that you have watched over him for years and you watch over him now. And we pray in the name of Jesus that you would bring healing to his body. We pray in the name of Jesus that you will astound doctors and nurses and medical staff and bring healing to his body. And Father, we, we're, we're open to whatever kind of healing you choose to do, whether it's by your miraculous touch or whether it's through the skill and precision of, of the doctors by correct diagnosis and medical care, Father. We, we will receive any healing that you choose, you choose to dole out for, for Nick, but we, we come now. We pray, Father God, that it would be contained, that you would give doctors and nurses and the staff clear insight of what to do next and how to take care of him. We pray that his body would receive the medication, Father, and it would do its work by your power. And Lord, we pray for the Biggs family, for Mike and Jenny, for Caleb, for Nate, for Holly, for Riley. We tell you, Lord, we, we lift them all up to you and, and ask, Lord, that you would comfort them along with Nick during this time. That, Father God, you would allow, allow all of us who, are, who are, have our little corner of the mat to continue to, to lift, lift them up, but also to lower Nick down into your presence over and over and over. Lord, we're, we're believing. We're believing for something miraculous because we know that you are the God who specializes in the impossible. And so, Father, he, he, hear, our, hear our cries. Hear our prayers as your people, as your children. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen.